By the mid-1930s, most people believed that war was imminent. Nearly all attempts to avoid confrontation or claim neutrality would be fruitless. Many knew that assurances about Hitler's peaceful intentions were worthless. Europe was preparing for war. With the headlines came fear. For Sweden, the defense of its neutrality required mobilization for the entire population. Recruiting centers sprang up across the country. Invasion was everybody's fear. At the railway stations, family and friends departed, filled with hope and fear. A final hug, a long train ride, ahead Long months of training and waiting. In Sweden, preparing for war was seen as arming for peace. Sweden's air force was a collection of light aircraft, only capable of token resistance to the German Luftwaffe. Their reconnaissance aircraft were slow, lumbering targets. Although effective in World War I, they now outlived their usefulness. Sweden's Prime Minister, Herr Albin Hansen, felt that his nation should produce its own weapons. The Swedish government quickly created Svenska Aeroplana Oxjobalaget, or Saab, in May 1937. Funding approved, the build-up began. Saab, uh, that is four letters, S-A-A-B, and it stands for, in Swedish, it's pronounced Svenska Aeroplan Aktiebolaget, and translated into English, it is Swedish Airplane, and Aktie is the same as stock, uh, we have it in stock market, and Bolag is corporation. So it's really Swedish Airplane Incorporated. Building aircraft requires complex engineering, planning and building technologies governed by integrated systems and controls. In order to acquire the necessary technology, Saab began licensed production of foreign aircraft, assembling German Junkers, JU-86K bombers. The JU-86 began life in 1934 as a commercial airliner. Within a year, a military version was being made available for export. In Germany, it formed the original bomber squadrons of the rearming Luftwaffe. It was considered obsolete by the time Saab obtained their license. Germany had designed newer aircraft and the Ju-86 was relegated to reconnaissance duty. Saab engineers had difficulty understanding the German advanced mathematics for strength and load calculations. Using what they learned from the German planes and American manufacturers, their skills grew. Eventually, Saab engineers designed, built, and tested a Swedish airplane. It was known as the Saab 17. It was a single-engine two-seater that could be configured as a dive bomber, a vertical bomber, or a reconnaissance aircraft. It was the first Swedish airplane to be built completely from metal.
The Saab 17 made its first flight in May 1940. 325 would be built in the next four years. It remained in service into the 1950s. Being a very small country and, and few resources, we had to figure out what is the best type of airplane for our conditions. Engineering in Sweden has a certain background, which is, uh, at least it was known for very, very high quality and making very good analysis early upstream. So the aircraft were fairly small and uh, you created uh, early new technology which was brought into the aircraft. A second plane, the BST-18, was a powerful twin-engined all-metal bomber. It was a major achievement for a young company. A year later, a third plane, the JA-21, a highly advanced fighter, with a pusher propeller began test flights. This radical design required an ejection seat to launch pilots safely past its propeller. This design eventually became Sweden's first jet. Its first flight almost ended in catastrophe when the landing gear brakes didn't release. The landing gear smashed into the fence at the end of the runway. Pilot Klaus Smith was able to complete the takeoff only to collapse the main gear on landing. As the end of the war drew near, Saab realized that post war commercial aircraft production wouldn't provide enough jobs. The solution? Build cars. When the World War II ended and the demand went down, uh, it was necessary to look for some other product for that area, for that specific area. And the plant was there, and uh, a natural thing was really to look for maybe just cars, because uh, that's another way of transportation. After World War II, American automobiles became common in Sweden. Rural towns were growing, Sweden was expanding its road system, and the need for personal transportation put pressure on dealers to provide new cars. Sweden had a climate that was, to say the least, challenging. Heavy snow in the north, with dense fog and rain in the south, made driving an adventure. Large American cars offered strength and style, but handled badly on ice. During the 30s and 40s, ANA, an independent auto assembler, was established to put together Chrysler automobiles. Taking advantage of cheaper labor and freight costs, Plymouth exported car kits to Sweden for assembly and sale. The 5,000 parts needed for each car were assembled by hand. Post-war Europe was impoverished. There was a high demand for steel to rebuild the continent. Any project that required large amounts of steel was subject to delays and shortages. Importing kit cars was a perfect interim solution in a ravaged economy. This process didn't require tooling, foundries or large stocks of raw materials. Although it only created a small number of cars, it did offer employment. In 1944, as the trend towards the small car was increasing, Saab assembled the team that would build its first car. During a World War II test flight, a German V-1 rocket crashed in the Baltic Sea near Sweden. Sixten Sarsen, a Saab design engineer, produced detailed drawings of the rocket's engines. His sketches of the V-1 parts were said to be secretly flown to England for analysis. 
Sarsen was a stylish fellow with the rare ability to think in metal. He could translate concepts into reality at a reasonable cost. As a design engineer, he was a genius. Sarsen and Gunnar Jungström, an airfoil engineer, were chosen to create Saab's first automobile. Jungström was well-educated and had an innate sense of form and function. Without any automotive experience, he was about to create a car. Rumor had it only two of Saab's original staff members possessed a driver's license. Gunnar Jungström is definitely the father of Saab cars, and he was from the very beginning, well, he's coming from uh, the Jungström family, which is a very well, well known engineering family. Uh, engineer, they engineer turbines, uh, ships, and, and, and then now airplanes, and then cars. It was obvious that the first Saab came from an aircraft manufacturer. Gunnar Jungström decided on front wheel drive and a two cylinder, two stroke engine. Uh, Sigtan Sarsson was the designer or uh, creating the exterior of the car and um, he was really the uh, visionary in terms of the visible things while Gunnar Jungström was a visionary of the more invisible things. It took less than six months to build the prototype. The components were hammered into shape by a 70 year old panel beater over oak dollies cushioned on piles of horse manure. It was an exhausting process. Materials were scarce. The design team scoured the local scrapyard for parts. The prototype was fitted with a pre-war German two-stroke engine and front-wheel drive. But the two-stroke engine, which was reliable for its time, would later become a millstone around Gunnar's neck. On February 27, 1947, Saab's board of directors approved the decision to proceed. A new car was born. After 100 days, the blockade... But the world was again becoming dangerous. In 1948, Soviet troops blockaded the access routes to the occupied city of Berlin. To Saab, this meant that all civil aircraft activities had to be abandoned in favor of military requirements. The Swedish Air Force expanded to become the fourth largest in the world. Meanwhile, the prototype was subjected to a punishing test program. It became apparent to company officers that this airfoil on wheels was indeed tough enough. But the demands for new military aircraft pushed back the first auto delivery to late 1950. The appearance of the Saab 92 was clearly the work of an aircraft designer. Its round shape and sweeping aerodynamic lines resembled no other car. Like the Ford Model T, it came in only one color. Saab's choice was dark green. Well, we had painted all our aircraft in, in military green. So, so there were stocks of military green paint there, and that was why it came in green. Most buyers liked the distinctive styling. The construction was extremely rigid, with a flat floor pan for low drag and clearance over rough, unplowed roads. The car was powered by a water-cooled, 25-horsepower, two-stroke, two-cylinder engine. In 1951, the Korean War broke out. Saab was now producing the J-29 fighter jet known as the Flying Barrel. Skilled labor was in short supply. Wages soared. Rising costs affected Saab's car production. with loads of space. Well, you have to, when you've got so many little monkeys. 
every time you start your car from cold. It takes a while for your engine to get full protection from its oil. Metal grinds against metal. The damage is permanent. Castrol GTX Magnetech works differently. Unique polarized molecules clinch like a magnet, dramatically reducing engine wear. Protect from the moment you turn the key with GTX Magnetech, the new oil from Castrol. Tell me one good thing about your bank. First Direct, 24-hour telephone banking. Tina, it's me. I'm Tempe. Oh, it's some office. Just one guy. He's a consultant or something. I think he's just starting. Doesn't look like one guy. Looks like a whole company. Your stuff is printing. Did you do all of this this morning? Yeah. You really do a lot. These are great. Thank you. Warden Associates, uh, hang on one second. Hello. I could, I could put my whole team on it if you like. Absolutely. I could have that ready as well. I'll get people working on it right now. And the heat's on, you'll keep your cool. Because Natural Plus has a new ingredient that releases fresh protection again and again and again. Let's have a break. Gosh, you're so beautiful. I thought I could communicate. <laughs> the commander will be with you in a minute. The link. Oh, sensitive teeth. You should try anything sensitive. Even in the extremes of hot or cold, its brilliant formulation helps prevent pain. Have you got any? No. Clean sensitive. Effective relief from sensitive teeth. Someone can give you three the price of two. Who always gives you three for two offers on a wide range of toiletries? Boots. For more information on the Skoda Felicia, call 0345 745 745 now. Elke werkdag om 10 uur. De Justice Files opent de dossiers van schuld en boete in het land van vrijheid en gelijkheid. Elke werkdag om 10 uur. De confrontaties die het verloop van de Tweede Wereldoorlog beslisten. In een nieuwe zesdelige serie Battlefields. Elke werkdag om 10 uur. De mooiste machines van deze eeuw. Over land en door de lucht met de exponenten van de moderne techniek. Boys Toys. Elke werkdag om 10 uur op Discovery. Saab's retail distributor suggested that they needed a $500 price increase. This would allow them to make the car more attractive by adding a trunk and a larger rear window. They also wanted to increase the headroom in the rear to make the seats more comfortable. The 92B was introduced in the fall of 1952. It absorbed the production capacity that was not already being used for aircraft. The 92 hit the world rally circuit with stunning success. Rallying provided the perfect environment for engineers to test their concepts. The standard models were so robust that it was unnecessary to reinforce the chassis for competition. But the engines were modified to triple their output. The early successes showed the world that Saab was as advertised, tough and reliable. Saab's aviation efforts were also getting noticed. In 1955, 
The J-29 flying barrel achieved a world speed record of 1,000 kilometers or 621 miles an hour. Sweden saw the need to increase the funding for supersonic research. This decision reduced valuable resources needed for car production. By late 1955, Sixten Sarsen's new automobile design, the Saab 93, was introduced. Although it sported a restyled front end, the real story was the smoother running, more powerful three-cylinder engine, which now delivered 33 horsepower. It was still a two-stroke engine and ran on a combination of gas and oil. To remind people to add oil to the mix when filling up, the gas cap had a printed reminder. Two-stroke engines were really not uh, that common in that period. And... Uh, People that were used to uh, conventional cars, they were filling just fuel. But our car had to have a combination of oil and fuel. And uh, we had to highlight this. Uh, and of course, it is necessary to highlight it when you start to fill, fill the fuel. That is why it was uh, noted on the fuel filler cap, please put in oil and fuel. Saab began to discover the powers of advertising as marketing experts set their sights on America. The car's aviation heritage and competition prowess helped to get attention, but Saab didn't want to move too fast. Without an efficient American parts and service organization, buyers might have to wait for weeks for repairs. Saab concentrated their sales effort on small, manageable groups of affluent buyers. Surveys showed that over 90% of these buyers were satisfied with their cars. They especially liked the good fuel economy and unusual features like the ability to convert the cars for sleeping. We didn't have the motels and hotels as you have here spread out over the country. So you had, like a snail, you had to have your, your house with you. Uh, so that was why it was created as, as, as a house, living house. So you could move wherever you, you liked and you just parked the car and you slept in it. Although Americans didn't like two-stroke engines, Saab's rally reputation created excitement and public demand. In 1956, Saab entered three cars in the Great American Mountain Rally and made a clean sweep. A car that was equally at home sliding through the countryside or transporting a family to church wasn't for everybody, but it began to attract loyal buyers. Exports to the USA rose rapidly, from nearly 300 cars in 1956 to over 6,000 in 1959. In just three years, Saab had turned America into its main export market. Many of the early model Saabs can still be found in northwestern Washington state. Two brothers alone own over 50 cars. Many proud Saab owners hope to drive their beloved cars forever. Skip Schott has made a living breathing new life into old Saabs. A collection of cars and parts is scattered around his house. As parts become more difficult to find, restorations take longer. The years have not been kind to many of these cars. In time, the metal and paint succumb to age and mileage. Some call this assortment of cast-off parts junk. Others see it as a treasure chest of opportunities. We drove this car up yesterday. Uh, a lot of fun to drive. Uh, ran 55 miles an hour in the freeway, no problem at all. Just uh, a lot of people waved at us, we waved back and smiled. When we, uh, when we organize an event for our club, we try to organize it someplace that we can drive to, because that's what they're made to be done. We don't, uh, we don't trailer them around and, and uh, spit and polish them. They get polished, but they also get driven. Well, the, the, the two-strokers, they, they do smoke, and that's, the, that's part of the mystique. And the, the people that are dyed in the wool two-strokers, they're always... They're always smelling the smoke, and uh, 
the the real aficionados they 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 discuss the uh, the nuance of the smoke and and is it really the old high M oil or is it new spectro oil or or what what is the uh, what is the nuance of this uh, of this smoke and a lot of people think it's pollution but no it's it's really uh, it's really clouds of love is what it is. <laughs> On the rally circuit, the Saabs of the 1950s produced even more smoke. Modified engines were now producing 50 to 60 horsepower. Eric Carlson proved what skill, daring, and a great little car could do. A legend among rally drivers, Carlson thrilled the racing world with his hard-charging style and competitive spirit. His rallying became famous because he took extremely high risks with a very, very small car. Um, he is uh, named as Eric Carlson on the roof, and that is, of course, because he really take very, very, took very, very big risks and turned over on the roof several, several times. But um, being that risk taker and trying to cope with it, um, he also became a winner. Even in the hands of an everyday driver, the Saab 93 was an impressive off-road machine, allowing the driver complete control over the terrain. But world events couldn't be controlled. In 1956, trouble in the Middle East led to the world's first oil crisis. In Sweden, the result was a ban on Sunday driving by private motorists and the introduction of gas rationing. This had an immediate effect on car sales. When oil was plentiful again, Saab was ready with a new model. The Saab 95, a two-door estate model or station wagon, was offered in 1959. Sixton Sarsen had envisioned a car much like the elegant Chevy Nomad. Performance-minded buyers felt its only drawback was a disappointing three-speed transmission. In 1960, after 10 years of car making, Saab unveiled its third model. The 96 became a Saab classic, featuring 50s body styling with 60s technology. The 96 featured Saab's first four-speed transmission for commercial use. Other features included a remote hood release, a bigger three-cylinder engine, an upgraded braking system, and an improved heater. Saab modified the instrument panel, making the controls easier to see and operate. Even the pedals were redesigned. The biggest improvement came with increased production at the Trollhutton plant. Now Saab had the capacity of producing 30 to 40,000 cars a year. By January 1965, Saab had produced more than a quarter of a million automobiles. It took just one more year to reach 300,000. Saab made a total of 1,500 product improvements on the 96 during the first six years of production. The new Monte Carlo model of the 96 offered a 55 horsepower engine, independent lubrication, and a triple carburetor. It was really just uh, an um, upgrading of performance, uh, offering um, different um, interior appearance uh, with bucket seats. Uh, it had a wood wooden steering wheel. So it was really looking more into the sporty market. Um, and I think the flavor was really coming from England, uh, where you had a lot of sports cars. Times were good. Production was up. The car business was booming. But internally, there was a struggle going on. 
Gunnar Ljungström was fighting for the introduction of a four-stroke engine. An improved paint job couldn't hide the fact that the two-stroke engines were trouble. Officially, they were reliable, but in fact, they had an endless succession of serious problems that the engineers were getting tired of solving. But Saab had spent a fortune on expanding its facilities, and management said there was no money to develop and produce a new engine. Bolstered by surveys that showed over 75% of the Swedish public would buy a four-stroke car, the engineers launched a series of tests. They were determined either to fix the two-stroke or convince management that increased sales would warrant the cost of retooling. The engineers subjected a series of four- and two-stroke engines to the most rigorous tests. This search for perfection was often pursued on the Saab test track with extreme secrecy. Saab engineers tested suspension, brakes, and engine performance. Saab's newly established rally department was able to engineer an amazing 86 horsepower from the tiny two-stroke engines, but the cars were still temperamental and difficult to control and drive. Engine development had reached its limit. Engine testing continued, the 96 became a rally machine. Saab's newly established rally department was able to engineer an amazing 86 horsepower from the tiny two-stroke engine. But the cars were still temperamental creations that were difficult to control and drive. Engine development had clearly reached its limit. A company hero, Eric Carlson, was known as an aggressive driver. He'd charge into blind corners on the theory that the road had to go somewhere. From 1961, Carlson won the British RAC rally three times in a row. He also won at the Monte Carlo rally in 1962 and 63. But Saab was no match for the new 200 horsepower machines that Ford. Porsche and Fiat were about to introduce. Gunnar Ljungström and engineer Rolf Melida continued to champion the development of a four-stroke engine. But management said the two-stroke must be fine if it's winning. By 1964, Saab was the only company using two-stroke technology and sales were falling. Change finally came in 1967. The 96 was transformed. The two-stroke was finished. In the late 60s, America was overtaken by events in Vietnam. This conflict would extend into the mid-70s, bringing with it a new generation of cars and a new generation of buyers. Even though Sweden took no part in Vietnam, the Swedish Ministry of Defense ordered 175 of Saab's Vigan aircraft in 1968. While defense sales were important, autos weren't ignored, but Saab would have to change to tap into the growing American market. In 1967, the Saab Sonnet was reborn. In 1956, a racing rule change had made it obsolete. It was a beautiful machine, but only six were originally produced. The revived Sonnet was used to test new technology. Now it's one of the most valued Saabs ever produced. That same year, Saab introduced its first world-class car. The era of inexpensive basic transportation was passing. 
It became clear to Saab officials that the next car would have to be bigger and more comfortable. Sixton Sarsen created a car with a long nose and a short rear deck. Enter the Saab 99. The 99 took over 400,000 engineer hours of design. Like all Saabs, the prototype was built by hand. Although the 99 was a totally new car, it was still clearly a Saab. Well, the 99 was really to try to take the step up in, uh, in um, a little larger car, uh, more family-oriented, offering more space. Uh, it was from the very beginning a um, um, four-stroke engine. It was also a very compact car, an extremely compact car from outside, but a very large car inside. And again, it, it was driven by engineers that wanted to be, to offer a lot uh, for least possible resources. Saab never used a frame in their cars. Unitary construction reduced weight and added strength. This allowed Saab the luxury of building one model without expensive redesign when new, more powerful engines were introduced. The 99's first engine was a Triumph design. It would later be replaced by a Swedish four-cylinder engine. Lab-coated destruction experts used every modern device to detect potential problems. For the first time, drivers could keep their headlights clear with the 99's new lamp wipers. Passengers rode in comfort with heated seats. Saab had not tried to make a modern status symbol. They thought that common sense design would last longer and perform better in a competitive market. Disc brakes, coil springs, a floor-mounted gear shift and overhead camshafts made the 99 a worldwide contender. Once again rallying beckoned. But during the 70s, developments were affected by the oil crisis. Saab began to experiment with turbocharging. A turbocharger gave a four-cylinder engine V8 performance and good fuel economy. In 1978, Saab introduced the astounding Turbo 99, setting a new competitive standard and boosting sales worldwide. But in the late 1970s, rally rules were changed. Totally modified cars could use budgets 10 to 20 times greater than Saab could afford. Saab left competition in 1980. Een doodnormale dag op kantoor. Totdat een vijandelijke macht Schotland binnendringt. De RAF reageert razendsnel. De 